So uh, I was uh, given the option to give a theory paper, and I decided to take the option. So you're in for 45 minutes, 50 minutes of uh, an account. So there's this whole kind of conversation in anthropology at the moment um, regarding this thing that's been called the ontological turn, which it turns out it was me who called it the ontological turn because I wrote, we co-wrote this introduction to Thinking Through Things 10 years ago. And I think we, in this kind of post-PhD, trying to impress everyone uh, mode, we said there's this quiet revolution in the discipline. And it's called the ontological turn. Um, but of course, it's slightly ridiculous. So anyway, I've spent the, the, the next 10 years trying to think, OK, why is it ontological? What is a turn? And can we think of it as a turn as more, you know, this kind of um, so, uh, and of course then there was a, a lot of debate and a lot of criticism and a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of anger and a lot of all this kind of stuff. So in that context, Morton Peterson and I, um, Morton Peterson is um, a colleague who works in Copenhagen and he's also kind of been involved in all this debate, decided to write a book called The Ontological Turn. Um, which is coming out next year. And what I'm going to read to you today is essentially a um, version of the introduction where essentially we put um, the, uh, our understanding of what this thing, the ontological term, is on the table. Uh, what we then do in the, in the second chapter, which I won't read to you today, is to distinguish um, our understanding of what could be an interesting turn towards ontology and anthropology from all the other understandings that are around and which are actually radically different. Uh, so um, we've distinguished the other ontological turns uh, as opposed to the one that we're interested in uh, in that chapter. And we can maybe take up those distinctions uh, in the discussion because there's a hell of a lot of confusion. So people, for example, say, ah, ontological term. That must be uh, Philippe de Scolat because he's been talking about the four ontologies. Right? Um, he's been using the same word, but in a very, very different meaning from the one that I understand. So, you know, it's that kind of distinction that we're trying. So, I'll do the classic thing of read. I'll try and read uh, as clearly as I can, um, and let me know if I'm going too fast. So, every so often, anthropology becomes possessed, like a swirling dervish, by a new turn. We have the interpretive turn, the linguistic turn, the ethical one, and so on. At present, it seems the new turn on the block is the so-called ontological one. And as I said, it's probably that I myself am responsible for calling it that, having proclaimed a decade ago the arrival of an ontological turn as a quiet revolution for anthropology in that introduction that we did with Amiria Hanara, who's now called Amiria Salmond, in case you get confused, and Sari Westel uh, 10 years ago. Since that time, a lot of commentary, much of it critical, has sought to bring into focus the position of this self-proclaimed turn in the landscape of contemporary anthropological theory. So my purpose in today's paper is to clarify some of the basic premises of what I understand as the rightful role of ontological perspectives in anthropological thinking. And I should emphasize that my own understanding on this score is not necessarily the same as that propounded by a host of other scholars who have in recent years also been identified in one way or other with a turn to ontology. For example, I mentioned Philippe Nescolat, Bruno Latour is another, Terry Evans, Eduardo Kuhn, who we were discussing yesterday, uh, Marisol de la Cadena, Mario Blasse. There's a whole bunch of people using this word, and of course they're related and so on, but they're not necessarily the, the line of thinking that I'm interested in. Even Tim Ingle sometimes is being invoked as an ontologist, which I think Tim Ingle is probably not in any way interested in being called, but anyway. Indeed, what I have to say here, in a way, summarizes a perspective that I've set out to articulate more fully, together with Morton Axel Peterson, in a forthcoming book, um, which, as I say, is entitled The Ontological Turn, predictably enough, in which uh, Peterson and I trace the development of what we take to be most distinctive in this line of thinking, in work by three scholars in particular, so these are the ontological turn, uh, as far as we're concerned, namely Roy Wagner, Marilyn Strathern, and most explicitly, because neither Wagner nor Strathern talk about ontology particularly, although we think that they exemplify the approach that we're talking about, but most explicitly, Eduardo Viveros de Castro. Um, 
as well as a younger collection of anthropologists that are taking their perspectives forward in different fields at present, right? So we have a kind of genealogy in that book. And in fact, after that second chapter that I mentioned, the third one is on Roy Wagner, the fourth one on Marilyn, the third and the fifth one on Eduardo de Castro. Castro. So we're basically kind of trying to trace that genealogy and basically explain as clearly and pedagogically as we can the thinking of thinkers who are quite complicated, such as Marilyn Um So that's how we trace it. So today I'll start by giving you a flavor of what I take this line of thinking to look like, with reference, first of all, to two examples. So I've got a, few, a bit of ethnography in there. Uh, which, as I shall suggest, uh, illustrate some of the most important characteristics of the ontological turn in anthropology. With these examples in mind, I shall then go on to articulate three basic ways in which what I understand to be the ontological turn expands, deepens, and in a sense radicalizes three anthropological demands that I would suggest have a much longer trajectory in the history of our discipline. So, the, so essentially I'm trying to characterize the ontological term as a radicalization of three things that we've always been doing in anthropology. Right? Um, and the first one is the demand for reflexivity. So it's a kind of radical uh, radicalization of, of, of reflexivity. Second, the demand of, for conceptualization, which I think is really the signature of this way of thinking. And third, briefly towards the end, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about experimentation. So reflexivity, conceptualization, and experimentation is the kind of um, the, the trinity, as it were, of, of signatures of the, of the ontological turn, as I understand it. So slightly uh, tongue-in-cheek, I call these the three ontological turn-ons, uh, and hence the title of my paper. So let me just start with the two examples. In his 1972 book, Habu, named after a key Darabi curing ritual, the Darabi are a people of uh, Highland people in, in Papua New Guinea. Uh, so Habu, named after a key Darabi curing ritual in which men impersonate ghosts, Roy Wagner argues that the aspects of life that the Darabi consider most salient and important, such as ritual, myth, exchange, magic, the naming of children, and, and plenty more, hunting, are directed not towards controlling the world uh, by subjecting it to collective conventions, but rather towards the opposite, namely transforming conventions by way of improvisation into something novel and unique. It's a bit like the theatre in some ways. Right? So from the Darby point of view, all the things that the anthropologist imagines as culture uh, for example, grammar, kin relationships, social order, norms, rules, and so on, are not conventions for which people are responsible, but are rather taken, the taken for granted constituents of the universe that form the backdrop of human activity. They are innate, in Wagner's terms, inasmuch as they belong to the order of what just is there, rather than the order of what humans have to do and are responsible for. Conversely, the things that the anthropologist imagines as nature, so that was culture, right? The things that the anthropologist imagines as nature, including not only the unpredictable facts and forces of the world around us, but also our own incidental uniqueness as individual persons, for the Darigi, constitute the legitimate sphere of human artifice. Human be beings, according to this image, do not stand apart from the world, bringing it under control with their conventions, but rather partake in the world's inherent capacity to transform itself by transgressing the conventional categories that the Darabi take for granted. And a very similar argument actually developed in mutual inference with Roy Wagner is, of course, for those of you who are interested in gender and uh, feminist thinking and so on, uh, in Marilyn Strathlin's famous paper, No Nature, No Culture, uh, The Hardin Case, which is a fantastic paper from 1980, I think. So Wagner was writing this kind of stuff in the 70s, and Strathern and Wagner together kind of developed these things. And I think that the Strathern paper captures the point that I just made really, really well. So, for example, to illustrate what I just said, when in the Habu ritual, Darabi men impersonate ghosts that are held responsible for certain illnesses, they're not acting out a cultural convention, conforming to a cultural script underpinned by indigenous categories such as ghosts or beliefs 
illnesses are caused by ghosts, for example, and so on. Um, so they're not following a kind of conventional cultural script. Right? Rather, like a jazz musician might bend, say, a conventional scale to improvise a solo that sounds alive and unique, they subvert such innate distinctions, and in this case particularly the distinction between living human beings and dead ghosts, to bring about an effect that is powerful precisely because it recasts, or in Wagner's terms, differentiates the categories that they take for granted. Taking as the granted state of the world that dead ghosts are dead ghosts and living people are living people, these being the kind of collectivizing categories of convention, in the Habu ceremony, men take on the characteristics of ghosts, temporarily enacting the startling possibility, startling to them, right, that dead ghosts can indeed come to life and interact with humans. In doing so, they artificially bring about a novel effect, namely ghosts that are also men, by temporarily transgressing ordinary distinctions between life and death, men and spirits, and so on. So, much as with jazz music, the success of the habu depends on people's capacity to render the predictable unpredictable, rather than the other way around. However many times the habu may have been performed in the past, its power as a ritual depends on the degree to which the participants can make it a fresh subversion of convention. In this sense, and contrary to anthropological arguments about ritual as a transfiguration of structure, culture, or ideology, think of Cliff Geertz or Morris Bloch or uh, Rappaport and so on, the habu is an anti-convention par excellence, or in Wagner's words, an invention. So to the extent that the habu instantiates, and here's the kind of syllogism in, in Wagner's famous book, The Invention of Culture, to the extent that the habu instantiates par excellence, in fact, exactly the kind of thing anthropologists would conventionally deem as cultural, Wagner's own invention of the habu as a form of invention transmutes through, to, uh, through into the idea of culture itself. So the, 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 the argument is, first premise, the habu is a form of culture. Let's say it's a classic thing that we would call culture. It's a ritual, right? Premise two, but it's also invention, as I've just argued. Therefore, three, culture two is a form of invention. So this is the possibility that Roy Wagner then goes on to develop in his next and most famous book of 1975, The Invention of Culture. And for those of you who are interested in this kind of literature, I would strongly, strongly advise uh, that if you want to understand that infernally difficult book that's called The Invention of Culture, it is really badly written, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, and I think Wagner admits that, uh, that a lot of it is badly written. Uh, he blames it on Chicago University Press. <laughs> um, <laughs> Read Habu first. So Habu is this beautiful ethnography, simple as drinking water. You know, it's fantastically simple to read, and it's got a ten-page introduction where everything is laid out in a very simple <laughs> way. And then the invention of culture is just a kind of overdrive of jargon, and because the guy's a genius, so he's just like piling it up. But but if you understand Habu, then you understand the invention of culture. I think. Anyway, now that was Roy Wagner. That was my first example. Um, how we get from this habu ritual to an idea of culture as invention. Now, zoom out of the highlands of Papua New Guinea, traverse the globe more or less 180 degrees on kind of Google Earth style, and zoom back into the inner city barrios of Havana, where I do my field work, on the West African-derived diviner cult of Ifa, whose full initiates are called Babalaos, uh, which means in, in Yoruba, fathers of secrets. Equivalent to the, to the Daribi Habu ceremonies in their social salience, the divinations that these Babalaos conduct in a variety of everyday and ceremonial contexts are considered by practitioners supremely important and prestigious because, as they say, Ifa tells the truth. Ifa bisalala. Indeed, if you go to consult a diviner as a client, say on a health complaint, and he tells you, and it's always a he, only heterosexual men can become Baba Laos. It's a very macho uh, religion. Um, so you go to a Baba Lao and uh, you have a problem, a health problem, and say he tells you your illness is due to witchcraft, or 
um, go to the doctor to have an x-ray done, which in Cuba is just as likely, he might tell you, it's witchcraft, don't go to the doctor and have an x-ray. Indeed, it, very often it's possible these days that um, the divine himself is actually a qualified doctor. So it's very, these two things are kind of very intertwined. Right? So whatever he tells you, it's witchcraft, have an x-ray done, whatever, you better listen to him. Because unlike similar advice you might receive from a friend, what makes the pronouncement of Ifa so special is not only that they're true, but that they, that they cannot but be true. A divinatory statement is by definition true. Its defining characteristic, if you like, is truth. Or, as practitioners put it, passing the logic out, in Ifa there are no lies and there are no mistakes. In Ifa no hay, no hay mentira y en Ifa no se equivoca. This is a kind of mantra-like statement that Cuban diviners and practitioners make. Right? So, if for Wagner the analytical hurdle to conceptualizing uh, Habu rituals was anthropologists' assumption that qua cultural they must be conceived as a set of world organizing conventions, that was the problem that we have to think of culture as this kind of conventional thing, right? So that was the hurdle that w Wagner had to overcome in order to conceptualize the Habu as invention, right? For me here, in relation to divination, the hurdle in making sense of the notion of truth, which is what I set out to do in, in my book on it, is the abiding tendency in the anthropological literature to assume that diviners' pronouncements must be imagined as world-depicting representations. It's the problem of representation that we discussed with Agnieszka last night. So from Fraser and Tyler, through Evans, Evans Pritchard and Vic Turner, up to people like Dan Sperber or Pascal Boyer, anthropologists have assumed from the outset of their, from the outset of their analyses <coughs> that what diviners provide for their clients are claims about the world. So divinations such as you are bewitched or an x-ray will help you are taken as statements about what philosophers proverbially call events or states of affairs. They're taken, in other words, as beliefs, which, in all of their apparent irrationality, which is the famous phrase that Dan Sperber uses, must then be accounted for by the anthropologist. How can Cuban people, famously well-educated by their revolution after all, believe in this stuff? Right? So that's the way that the anthropological problem is formed with this divination. Diviners are giving you an image of the world, you know, they're making a truth claim about what the world is really like, you know. You are bewitched, that, you know, that's a claim about a fact in the world, right? So given that this is pretty weird and apparently irrational, how do we explain this? How do humans get to believe these things? That's the kind of classic way of setting the problem up for, for anthropology. Notice, however, and this is where my own argument kicks in, that the idea that diviners are in the business of representing the world in their statements makes a nonsense of what, from an ethnographic point of view, as I indicated earlier, makes divinatory truth claims so special, namely that they're meant to be beyond doubt, indubitable, and true by definition. As contingent statements of fact, after all, representations, you are bewitched, go have an x-ray, and so on, are inherently doubtful. Whereas divinations, as I've claimed ethnographically, are anything but that. So just as Wagner had to reconceptualize the idea of culture in view of the Habu's divergence from our expectations of what culture is, so I had to reconceptualize the notion of truth in view of its divergence from Ifa divination. That's the strategy I'm trying to single out here as key for the ontological term. So to cut a long argument short, in my book that Agnieszka mentioned earlier, I did just that. First, by intensifying the aporia, using that kind of Greek Socratic word, the aporia, generated. So first, by intensifying the aporia generated by my ethnographic conundrum, showing that none of the standard conceptualizations of indubitable truth, truth, truth beyond doubt, was adequate to these divinatory pronouncements. So I won't bore you with a list, so I went through a kind of philosophical tourist trail to find ways in which people have conceptualized truth beyond doubt in philosophy and see if it worked on divination uh, as, I, as I was seeing it ethnographically. So what philosophers call analytical statement, Saul Kripke's rigid, rigid designators, the cogito argument, cogito ergo sum, truth beyond doubt, uh, 
proofs of the existence of God in theology and so on. So I tried all these kind of philosophical devices on my material, and none of that worked, right? From which I conclude that it would be necessary to confection or make up a more customized, if you like, concept of truth, one that crucially would render divinatory statements as being beyond doubt, as the ethnography shows, while at the same time doing justice to their highly contingent looking and time bound character. So, after all, from the point of view of its logical form, that the statement, you are bewitched, looks exactly the same as any ordinary contingent statement of fact, which will be um, normally open to doubt, such as you know, the statement, this pen is, is white. Right? That kind of statement looks exactly like that kind of statement. The problem is that Cuban diviners say that if the diviner says to you, this pen is white, that's beyond doubt. So, what do we make with that? Right? How do we, what kind of concept of truth can we use it? Do we want a concept of truth that gives you this? kind of logical necessity while doing justice to the very contingent and, and kind of temporary status of the statements that the divines are making. Right? So that's, that was the kind of challenge that I confronted. What I came up with was, in a way, a kind of logical merger of those two requirements, indubit, indubit, uh, indubitability um, with contingency. I kind of merged those two things together. So divinations are indubitable, I suggested, and this, I guess, is the main move of my, of my analysis, because they're not to be conceived as representations of the things that they are about, but rather as novel definitions of them. Okay. So, for example, the divinatory statement, John, you don't get many Johns in Cuba, but anyway, John is bewitched, or Jorge is bewitched, right, does not predicate the property of being bewitched onto this John character, in which case that statement would be completely open to doubt, but rather redefines who or what John is. So as a definition, the statement is indubitable because just like what philosophers call an analytic truth, such as bachelors are unmarried men, that kind of truth by definition, it's, it's true exactly by definition, right? But unlike, so basically, when a diviner says John is bewitched, he's doing exactly the same thing as a dictionary that says all bachelors are unmarried men. He's defining what John is. He's not making a claim about John. John already exists, and I'm making a claim about him. He's defining what kind of thing John is, right? But unlike these analytic truths, like all bachelors are unmarried men, which are imagined as kind of immutable tautologies, uh, divinatory truths are constitutively, uh, are constitutively temporarily and always in motion. Temporary and always in motion. Last month, John was fine. Now he's bewitched. And next week, if he takes the proper ritual measures against the sorcery, he'll be free of this sorcery again. He won't be bewitched anymore. Hence, if divinations are manners of defining people, their definitions here have to be understood as temporal artifacts that are able to engender serial transformations of the objects or the people that they define. So to reflect this, initially I called them inventive definitions, i.e. definitions that bring about the objects that they define. And later I adopted a rather more suggestive kind of shorthand that was kindly given to me by Eduardo Viveris de Castro in a conversation, namely infinitions. So I made up this word, or Eduardo made up this word, infinitions, and I used it. Uh, so to infine something is to render its infinitive form, its conceptualization, as an act. So basically I, I said that divinatory truth claims are these infinitions, they're these the manners in which diviners define the things that they talk about, and in defining them, transform them ontologically. Fine, okay, so I ran you through two kind of examples, high uh, analytical jinx. Uh, but there you go. So, so much for these examples. And these examples, I would suggest, are examples of what I'm now going to call the ontological turn in action. So, this is the kind of, the, there were examples of the ontological turn turning, as it were, right? Now, the first thing I want to point out here is that each of the two examples demonstrates the most major element of this thing that people are calling the ontological turn, or that I'm calling the ontological turn. Namely, that it is, strictly speaking, a methodological intervention concerning what I would argue is the most basic anthropological problem of all. Namely, how best one might describe the ethnographic materials with which one is confronted as an anthropologist. Right? The ontological turn 
as the two examples show, is above all a technology for anthropological description, a method of description. More precisely, it is a method aimed at creating the conditions under which one is able to describe things in one's ethnographic data that one would not otherwise have been able to describe. To see things, if you like, one could not otherwise see. So the ontological turn is indeed, in essence, a methodological intervention as opposed to, say, a metaphysical or philosophical one. So people hear this word ontology. And they think, oh my god, this must be Heidegger or something. Yeah? Uh, it's exactly not Heidegger, that's the whole point. It's, it, and I'll, I'll show why uh, as the paper goes on. So it's strictly speaking a methodological, not a metaphysical or philosophical intervention. It is a response to that fundamental anthropological question. How do I enable my ethnographic material to reveal itself, dictating its own terms of engagement, compelling me to see things that I had not expected or imagined to be there. What are the analytical techniques by which such a form of anthropological vision, if you like, can be cultivated? Okay. Now this, of course, is a version of anthropologists' most abiding methodological concern, namely with how to neutralize the danger of one's own presuppositions, constraining or otherwise preempting or even predetermining their capacity to describe, interpret, explain, or analyze the phenomena with which they're confronted. The standard problem of whether it's even possible to take off the socially, culturally, politically, and so on, tinted glasses through which we must necessarily see the world, which typically in anthropology is referred to technically as the problem of ethnocentrism. Right? So I'm saying the ontological turn is in some very important sense a response to basically that problem, the problem that we we're very accustomed to calling ethnocentrism. However, what makes the ontological turn distinctive is the fact that it recasts, indeed, I would say radicalizes. I know it's very irritating when people say we're being really radical here, but I can't find any other way to express this. Right? What makes the ontological turn distinctive is that it recasts, or indeed radicalizes, this problem. The epistemological concern with how best to see things is turned into an ontological problem of what there is to be seen there in the first place. Accordingly, what ultimately tints the anthropologist's glasses are not social, cultural, or political, or other presuppositions, but at the very base, ontological ones. By which, here I mean, just the most basic commitments about what things are, including things like society, culture, and politics. Hence, the long-standing epistemological worry about ethnocentrism, or solipsism, essentialism, and so on, is reconceived here as an ontological problem. How do I, as an anthropologist, neutralize or otherwise hold at abeyance my assumptions about what the world is and what's in it, in order to allow for what is in my ethnography to present itself as what it is, and allow for the possibility that what is there in this ethnography might be different from what I had expected. So that's essentially the problem. So just think back on the example. I, Wagner thought, for example, that he knew as an anthropologist what culture is. Right? He's confronted with a harbour ritual which pushes him to imagine a different way of thinking about what culture is. Right? That's an ontological shift. So what counts as culture for, say, Maurice Bloch is a different thing than what counts as culture for Roy Wagner two different things, not two different ways of seeing the world, but two different constituents of the world, if you like, right? hence an ontological difference. Uh, I hope this will become more and more uh, comprehensible as we go along. So, this is also why the notion of a turn, this kind of self-advertising brand, right? this notion of a turn perhaps is a little bit more than just rhetoric in this context. Sure, the term is meant partly to advertise as radical the break with older ways of thinking of the basic methodological problems of anthropology, as is the case with other self-purported terms in the discipline. More importantly, however, the notion of a turn in this case also describes the particular modus operandi that this methodological reorientation implies. Above all, drawing attention to the basic reversal involved in understanding the problem of tinted glasses, this kind of ethnocentrism problem, as an ontological problem. 
For if solving this problem has always involved finding ways to question or otherwise qualify presuppositions that stand in the way of grasping the native's point of view, to use Bronislaw Malinowski's original formulation of the anthropological challenge, thinking of these presuppositions as ontological implies a radicalization of this pursuit, such that anthropology's capacity to turn their own presuppositions uh, and thus to transform their field of analytical vision is released to its maximal potential. Actually, I'm struck with two po very po important Polish people are relevant here. Uh, Bronislaw Malinowski, but also Copernicus. You know, there's this kind of idea of a turn. Right? So the kind of Copernican revolution uh, implied in, in, in the way that this ontological term uh, is, is uh, articulated. Right? So this capacity to turn on our own presupposition is released to its maximal potential, or, or that's what we're trying to do, essentially, right? So the signature move of the ontological turn is just that, a thoroughgoing attempt to turn the relationship between ethnographic materials and analytical resources on its head. Right? Rather than treating ethnography as the object of its analytical concepts and procedures, the turn to ontology treats ethnography as, above all, their source. Right? Ethnography becomes the source of our concepts, not the object of our concepts. Ethnography thus becomes the ground, rather than just the field, upon which anthropology renews its very resources as an intellectual project. Right? So my two examples earlier were supposed to illustrate that. Right? You go out to Papua New Guinea, you come back with a new concept of culture, a new way of conceiving of what culture is. Right? So the a fundamental, the, the central concept of American cultural anthropology, an American like Roy Wagner, goes out to Papua New Guinea and comes back with a, with a, with a, with a different concept. Right? In my case, the example that I gave of Ifa, the concept was that of truth. Truth, a pretty important concept in any kind of science or whatever. You go out to Cuba, hang out with diviners for two years, and come back and say, okay, we've got to rethink what the concept of truth is. Right? So rather than having a concept of truth or belief and trying to expose it to the, uh, um, uh, not expose it, but apply it to the ethnographic material, it's precisely the, the lack of fit onto the ethnographic material that has this kind of the ethnography bites back effect, right? And makes you transform in this Copernican revolution way your own concept of truth, your own concept of culture, your own concept of society, as in Marilyn Strathern, and the individual, and, and so on. Right? That, that's essentially what the move is, right? So each of these kind of examples involves a basic reversal from trying to grasp the native's point of view, to use the Malinovskian phrase, to striving to overcome what one already grasps in order the better to be grasped by it. Right? And that's all the turn is, the attempt to be grasped by the native's point of view, not to grasp the native's point of view. Still, this reversal has profound consequences for how, I think, for how we think about the whole project of anthropology, its intellectual contribution, basic manners of thinking, and the philological wherewithal. So questioning the authority of elementary contrasts that are often presented as foundational to the project of anthropological research between, say, nature and culture, individual and society, matter and symbol if you're doing religion, or indeed data, method, theory, the ontological turn elevates the contingencies, the specificity, right, and the, the alterity of the difference of ethnographic materials as a platform from which to radicalize the activity of anthropology itself in a spirit of abiding empirical, theoretical, and methodological experimentation. In this process, core objects of study, for example, exchange, kinship, personhood, ritual, artifacts, politics, or objects of theoretical debate, for example, society, culture, time, belief, materiality, power, subjectivity, and objects of methodological concern, such as data, evidence, comparison, generalization, model making, research ethics, and so on, all of these things are rendered open to wholesale reconceptualization. What are the objects and forms of anthropological thinking, and what could they become are the irreducibly ontological questions that lend this turn its name, right? So what is society? What is data? Right? Um, what is exchange and so on? You know, what counts as, as time, right, or whatever? These are ontological 
uh, questions that, that, that the ontological term kind of style anthropology is, is really about. Nevertheless, it's important to emphasize here that far from representing a radical rupture with previous approaches, this manner of thinking of anthropology's turn to ontology has deep links with key figures in the history of anthropological theorizing, including not only famous ancestors such as Levi Strauss, he's a big favorite, I think, of a lot of the people, Evans Pritchard or Franz Boas, but also influential thinkers and ideas from the discipline's more recent past including certain part-overlooked developments within and traffic between anthropology's three main traditions, the American, the British, and the French, as epitomized, interestingly, by Roy Wagner, Yank, American, Rams Firm, Brit, and Eduardo Verst Castro, Brazilian, but actually French, uh, in the sense that, <laughs> that he's a kind of real structuralist in, in that way, right? Um, so, you know, it's quite funny that that's the genealogy, so it includes the three kind of big traditions. And I say this because I should say I'm not English, right? Because I would, would never say that I'm a British. Uh, I'm actually from Greece and Denmark. So. Like you, I see these things from the outside. So, um, so to play that, so what, what I'm saying is that, you know, notwithstanding all this hype and so on, we're very, very keen to trace the, 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 the fact that, you know, what I'm talking about here is nothing new, really, right? It's made perhaps a particular radicalization of certain things that is, have been happening all along, you know, ever since, you know, I talked about Malinowski, for God's sake, you know, that's not particularly new, right? So, um, so it's tracing that, that kind of line, right? So to play down the ontological turn's claim to novelty and rupture, however, is by no means to deny its significance. That I have to hold on to, right? In fact, the methodological and analytical ramifications of the turn to ontology are potentially radical indeed, since they entail a fundamental reconfiguration of what it means to do anthropology, I, I would say. But where more concretely does this radicalism of the ontological turn reside, if not in a revolutionary rupture with anthropology's past? In what follows, I want to show how the unique contribution of the ontological turn lies in the way in which it radical, radicalizes or intensifies, as Morton Peterson says. Uh, a lot of what I'm saying is kind of has come out in conversation with Morton, and some of the words are his, and some of some a little bit ventriloquating him as well. So I want to show that the unique contribution comes down to how it radicalizes or intensifies certain existing but partly dormant potentials in the anthropological project. More precisely, I want to argue, the turn to ontology uh, allows for a radicalization and in, an intensification of three research activities that have been of abiding anthropological concern always, namely reflexivity, as I said earlier, conceptualization, and experimentation. So let's consider each of these in turn. Uh, and um, as I said, I call them the three ontological turn on to the final right? So the first one is reflexivity. The ontological turns radicalization of uh, anthropologists' long-standing commitment to reflexivity is an obvious place to begin. After all, the easiest way to grasp the significance of what we've called the basic reversal marked by the ontological turn, this Copernican revolution, that of giving logical priority to the, ethno to the ethnography over its analysis in order to release its full potential as a source rather than just an object of anthropological insight, that's the key thing is to think of it as a particular manner of radicalizing the call to reflexivity in anthropology, right? this reversal. In the broadest and most inclusive sense, one may think of the call to reflexivity as the injunction in whatever one is doing to be attentive also to the manner in which one does it, its conditions of possibility, so to speak, of what one's doing. So the basic move of the ontological turn in this connection is as simple as it is Radical, I would suggest. Yes, focus reflexively on the conditions of possibility of anthropological knowledge, but think of these conditions ultimately not as social, cultural, or political, as we are accustomed to, we were told to do in the 1980s, but as ontological ones, which is to say conditions pertaining to what things might be. Right? So that's the radicalization of reflexivity that we're suggesting. It is important to note here that in the context of this argument, ontology, or the ontological, does not refer to some kind of substantive level or field or, phenom or phenomenon. One say that might be distinguished from other such levels or fields, such as the social, the cultural, the political, 
the moral, the aesthetic, the economic, the mental, the biological, the affective, and so on. So you have all these things, and then you have the ontological. You have the social, the political, and then you have the ontological, right? Uh, as being somehow maybe deeper or more fundamental than them. So some, you know, when we hear this, it's a heavy word, ontology. It's ancient Greek, you know. So you've got the ontology at the base, and then you've got politics, society, and then you have the effective and the economic. That kind of, high, that kind of image, forget it. That's not what we're talking about, right? And this, presumably, is some kind of shadow of a vaguely philosophical derived notion of ontology, which is, imagines ontology is concerned with the deepest level of existence pertaining to the great matter of being, the capital B. That's the Heidegger stuff we were talking about, we were talking about before. Foundational categories and so on, right? Nothing of that. If anything is deeper about the ontological turn when compared to standard forms of social, cultural, political, or other reflexivity, that is the manner in which it enacts the call for reflexivity itself. And this is not precisely because ontology marks out some deep level of reality that might encompass or otherwise ground these other fields, the social, the political, and so on, imagined as more derivative or shallow than it, but because posing the question of anthropological assumptions in ontological terms to ask what kinds of things are there is above all to refuse any prior commitment as to what kinds of things might provide the ground for such a reflexive term in the first place. Right? Operating always as an adjective, as an adjective or adverb, never as a noun, the ontological is a call to keep open the question of what phenomena might comprise a given ethnographic field. Or how and how anthropological concepts have to be modulated or transformed the better analytically to see those things that are in the field. It is in this sense that it represents an intensification of, rather than a rupture with, more traditional forms of anthropological reflexivity. Instead of closing off the horizon of reflexivity in the name of some sort of ultimate reality that might ground it, an ontology in a substantive sense, the ontological turn attempts to keep that horizon perpetually open. Radicalized in this manner, reflexivity goes all the way in, as it were. So you go with reflexivity all the way in, you never stop. There's never something that you can actually hold on to and say, okay, that exists, that we know is there, and let's build from there, a bit like Descartes might do or something. Right? Nothing. It, there's no stopping point to reflexivity. Now, this may sound like an entirely debilitating way of thinking. It conjures an image of anthropologists forever mired in an awkward, uh, sorry, in an awkward, I was going to say, in an inward-looking self-critique, unable to say anything positive about the ethnographic worlds in which they engage, this being the standard charge against anthropology's so-called crisis of representation in the mid-1980s. Isn't all this just a new version of anthropological navel-gazing, only worse for being so deliberate and radical? In a manner that may at first appear paradoxical, however, avoiding just this pitfall is very much part of the point of this turn to ontology. To adapt a metaphor from Roy Wagner, the ontological turn involves a figure ground reversal, like, you know, is it a woman or a face, you know, that kind of thing. You see the figure of the ground, or, you know, the glass. Or Gestalt. Gestalt. Thank you. So the ontological turn involves a figure ground reversal, as in Gestalt, uh, of the very idea of reflexivity, such that ethnography becomes the ground against which ontological commitments, what is X, right? what is time, what is culture, what is ritual, are figured and refigured. For if, in its postmodernist version, anthropological reflexivity took the form of deconstruction, right? critically debunking positive representations with reference to the social, cultural, political, etc., conditions of their production, the kind of social constructivist kind of approach, then it's, in its ontological rendition, reflexivity equates this critical impulse for deconstruction with generative acts of construction. The change really is quite simple, yet has far-reaching consequences for the anthropological project. If what gets in the way of seeing new things in our ethnography are prior ontological assumptions as to what those things can be in the first place, then overcoming this predicament of ontology right, must involve making those assumptions explicit and then changing them. So the very requirement critically to move away from one set of assumptions precipitates the need positively 
to refigure them in a way that allows previously obscure aspects of the ethnography to become apparent. In this sense, the, uh, uh, sorry, it is in this sense that the ethnography becomes the ground of new concepts, providing the lever with which anthropological vision can be transformed. That's a weirdly mixed metaphor. The lever with which the vision can be transformed. That doesn't work at all. Anyway, uh, the manner in which the, the anthropological vision can be transformed. By radicalizing anthropology's call for reflexivity to the point of reversal, then, asking ontological questions in this way turns the negative procedure of deconstruction into a positive procedure for reconstruction. That's so, Wagner has to deconstruct the notion of culture as convention, but only then to reconstruct it, invent, a new concept of culture as invention. Thereby, by the way, doing culture himself, right? part of the trick. So it's not this kind of postmodern, critical of everything, everything has to be deconstructed. It's the very act of deconstruction, because it's so radical, always leads you to a new position, right? to a positive position. Too. OK, the second, uh, how much have I got? Ten points? No? Yeah. Something like that? So the second one, conceptualization. We, we've done reflexivity, now we'll do conceptualization. So, it is just this capacity, not only to subject one's prior assumptions to critical scrutiny, but to generate new ways of thinking out of one's ethnographic materials that defines the second sense in which the ontological term radicalizes the anthropological project, namely through the cardinal role it accords to the work of conceptualization. Indeed, the notion of conceptualization connects directly to the basic methodological thrust, me methodological thrust of the ontological term to the extent that concept here should be read as more or less synonymous to the more grave-sounding expression ontological assumption. Right? So I'm taking concept and ontological assumption to be the same thing. If an ontological assumption is an assumption about what something is, then it turns, then it turns on how the concepts involved are defined. To ask, for, for instance, what is a person, as plenty of anthropologists do, is to ask how is a person to be defined which is the same as asking how are persons to be conceptualized. So basically, ontological assumption and conceptualization are the same thing. So to assert that the ontological term boils down to the idea that anthropologists' engagement with their ethnography may require a shift in their ontological assumptions is to claim simply also that how to conceptualize things within a given ethnographic encounter is among their most basic concern. More than a break with earlier ways of thinking of, about anthropology then, this focus on conceptualization is better considered as a particular way, again, of radicalizing aspects of anthropological practice that have been present in the discipline for a very long time. Certainly, taken on its own, the idea that anthropological thinking may involve the need to revise one's concepts of things hardly sounds very radical, considering that ideas about anthropology's role in questioning what uh, is taken for granted, relativizing things, denaturalizing them, displaying the variability of human ways of being, including ways of thinking or of seeing the world, and so on, are so common that they appear almost banal when listed in this way. Indeed, as anthropology's special gift for using people's varied life ways to present alternatives to what we may otherwise have taken for granted, um, Sorry, is that special gift for presenting alternatives to what we have otherwise taken for granted not also what has lent the discipline its sharpest critical edge, its abiding political mission uh, of what is sometimes called cultural critique? Indeed, seen in this light, our perhaps rather cerebral sounding insistence on anthropology's capacity for concept creation may look meek and non engaged in comparison to this kind of critical project. And yet assimilating our call for, con for conceptualization to such long-standing critical anthropological concerns does fail to recognize the significant ways in which these concerns are recast by the ontological term. And this is so for two interconnected reasons. Firstly, it should be noted that more than just pointing out the obvious need for anthropologists to pay attention to their concepts, the ontological term makes this the pivotal task for anthropological thinking its primary challenge. Right? So we're really kind of reshifting very much on this question. Conceptualization in this sense is the analytical trademark of the ontological term, just as, say, the goal of explanation epitomizes positivist approaches 
while that of interpretation typifies hermeneutic ones. Okay? So just as we would say, you know, Dan Sperber or other positivists like him, they think anthropology is about explaining stuff. Or Cliff Gibbs or other interpretivists, hermeneutics like him, think anthropology is about interpreting stuff. Right? We're saying the ontological term is about conceptualizing stuff. Right? So it's that, it's that kind of signature. Right? Indeed, much of the theoretical traction of the ontological term comes down to the alternative that it presents to this rather hackneyed choice in the social sciences between explanation and interpretation. I mean, when I was a student, that was where the game was at, right? Are you with the explaining crew or are you with the interpreting crew? You know? Or maybe you were with the kind of Adorno, Frankfurt, critical theory crew or something. But anyway, you know, that, that was essentially the kind of polarity of social science. And I think perhaps for a lot of people still it's right? So we're saying this focus on conceptualization is, if you like, a third way with no political uh, connotations uh, out of that dilemma, right? which I, th I think is a very kind of 20th century dilemma. For anthropologists to imagine their task as that of explaining why people do what they do, they must first right, suppose that they understand what these people are doing. Right? If you're Dan Sperber and you want to explain why people believe in apparently irrational beliefs, presumably first you know what those things that those people supposedly believe are. Right? The ontological turn often involves showing that such why question, the task of explanations, are, found, are founded on a misconception of the what, a misconceptualization. Right? For example, the question of why certain people might believe in nations, say, or ghosts, may be raised precisely because questions as to what a nation or a ghost might be have not been properly explored in the first place. Right? That's our critical argument. And similarly, for, for hermeneutics, right? conceived as cultural translation, say, to imagine that one's job as an anthropologist is to interpret what people say or do, one must assume that one is in principle equipped with concepts that might facilitate such a process. To this, the ontological term counterposes the possibility that the reason why what people say or do might require interpretation at all may be that it goes beyond what the anthropologist is able to understand from within his or her conceptual repertoire. Once again, the task of conceptualization assumes paramount importance. This brings us to our second point concerning the central role of conceptualization in the ontological term. For while the contrast between conceptualization and explanation is quite stark, I think, the distinction between conceptualization and interpretation may seem a bit too fine to be clear. Does the call to conceptualization really add anything to the old insight that in order to understand what people say and do, one must sometimes have to change the way one thinks oneself? I mean, that's pretty standard in anthropology, right? Is interpretation not in fact interpretation, not conceptualization, not in fact all about articulating ethnographically alternative conceptual universes, what used to be called world views, local knowledge, to use Clifford Yeats's expression, or just cultures in the classic sense, right? Now, admittedly, there is a degree of continuity between the act of interpretation and that of conceptualization. Once again, however, the difference lies in the particular manner in which the project of ontological reconceptualization that we are articulating here radicalizes earlier ways of thinking about the role of conceptualization in anthropological analysis. For even if conceptual shifts have always been a feature of anthropologists' interpretations, they have most typically exhausted themselves in insights of the type, for the X, time is circular, with the past ever returning to the present. Or among the Y, the whole among, uh, amounts to more than its parts. Or according to the Z, things have spirits, and so on. Uh, perhaps you recognize who the uh, Y and the Z are, right? So classic kind of astrological moments, right? Now, in fact, it is nothing short of an intellectual scandal, I would suggest, that these kinds of propositions have been accepted for so long in anthropology as genuine possibilities for thinking. Alternative conceptualization, the inverted commas, of time, totality, objects, and so on. As with the very idea of relativism that they're so often used to demonstrate, the fact that such statements are so familiar to anthropologists and their audiences as pronouncements about other people's beliefs or worldviews takes nothing away from the basic fact that in themselves they are ambiguous in the very least and often border on downright incoherence. 
It should only take a moment's thought to realize that, evocative as it may sound, the idea of, say, a past ever returning to the present is deeply confusing and confused. Uh, I mean, what, uh, not where are we? Yeah, what exactly is past about the past if it can be said to be ever returning to become present? Right? It's kind of contradiction in terms, really. Right? Similarly, beyond its elegant air of paradox, in what sense exactly are parts that add up to less than their whole parts at all? Right? And what is the idea of a thing meant to amount to when we say that it has a spirit? Aren't things precisely the kinds of things that don't have spirits, by definition? So the ontological term distinguishes itself in the most thoroughgoing way from these blind forms of relativism by taking seriously the work of conceptualization that they should imply. It starts from the premise that what makes genuinely alternative the possibilities for thought that ethnographies can provide is that they can go beyond the anthropologist's capacity to, to describe them by abusing concepts in their familiar senses. To avoid the abuse of concepts that the, such descriptions involve and the confusions that they must inevitably create, and I think that a, a lot of our colleagues in other disciplines don't take us seriously precisely because we say things like, well, you know that for peasants in Greece, time is circular, right? You know, the past is the present. It's like, what? You know, I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense what you just said. You know, I mean, you know it, it's not, it's nonsense, right? It sounds great, but it's just nonsense. Um, so, Sorry, I interrupted myself. Um, so, <laughs> so, to avoid the abuse of concepts that such descriptions involve and the confusions that they must inevitably create, ontologically minded analysis takes on the task of providing the conceptualizations that are needed to render ethnographic descriptions sensible. How might, how might one indeed conceptualize time as circular? What might past, present, and future amount to in such a manner of thinking? Or what do we need to do to the concepts of part and whole in order radically to alter their mathematics? And what might a thing be, and what might a spirit be, for the two to be conjoined conceptually? In taking seriously the requirement to follow through with these kinds of conceptual experimentations, then, the ontological term can be seen ultimately as an attempt to take the challenge of relativism to its ultimate conclusion reflexivity all the way in, if you like, as I said before, and conceptualization all the way out, all the way, that is, to concepts that can stand up for themselves. Right? So I think that's also the sense in which this project for anthropology borders a lot on kind of philo philosophical analysis, right? Because it requires of the anthropologists, once they've realized that among Greek peasants or whatever, time is circular, that, oh, okay, we've got to do something a little bit similar to what Nietzsche did or something. So we've got to rethink what time itself might be, right, which is an ontological question. So the anthropologist, in trying to uh, act out conceptually the ethnographic alterity that she encounters, has to become a bit of a philosopher. Right? And I think the problem is that a lot of anthropologists just don't do that and are left at the level of describing Greek peasants as having circular time, which sounds very poetic, but actually doesn't mean much. Now, I had a third thing, but I'm going to leave it because I think I've run out of time. The third thing was on, on uh, experimentation. And I was reminded, since we've done two polls, we're going to do a third poll. And I want to say this uh, as a way of closing to convey a little bit this point about experimentation, who is uh, uh, Grotowski as the, the theatre maker. Um, in a way, I think what I'm describing here is a kind of Grotowskian anthropology, right? So the way I'm not a major theatre expert by any means. I read the, the famous book. Um, towards a poor theatre, uh, Barber's collection of Grotowski's wisdom and so on. Um, but, you know, Grotowski takes a bunch of actors and puts them in a little hut in northern Italy or whatever, or in Poland, uh, and basically makes them unlearn every bit, you know, every muscle in their body, essentially, has to be deconstructed, if you like, right? So all the habits, you know, how to drink, you know, all the things that we do have to essentially very, very intensively be worked upon. Why? In order to create this maximal possibility for the actor's body to be able to embody Agamemnon or Hamlet or whatever character a particular three play might throw at him, right? The idea being that our bodily habits, right, get in the way of our capacity to enact something different from what we are. 
So it's a bit like Jack Nicholson. He's a shit. He's a, you know, he's a great guy to watch, but he's not a great actor because it's always Jack Nicholson, right? I mean, that's what we say. Right? Whereas Daniel Day Lewis is a fantastic actor because look, you know, he suddenly become Lincoln or, or whatever it might be. Right? So, uh, and Grotowski's method or whatever you, you call it, or experimentation, was exactly to constantly find new ways to undo the actor in order to do the actor in a, in, in Agamemnon or, or Hamlet or whatever. So what we're saying here, essentially, for the ontological term, is exactly the same procedure, right? Is that imagine the, the play, you know, Shakespeare or whatever, being the ethnography, right? And the ethnography throws at you possibilities that your own habits of thought get in the way of being able to, to, to enact conceptually, right? So your assumption about what culture is, or your assumption about what a person is, or your assumption that you know, if you add all the parts, you end up with a whole, or whatever, gets in the way of being able to enact conceptually the ethnographical territory that you might be encountering, Greek peasants or, or whatever. Right? Uh, so it's exactly that kind of experimental process of finding ways to undo your conceptual self in order the better to be able to enact the ethnographic other that the ontological term is about. So I think of it as a kind of Grotowski and anthropology in that sense. Thank you.